Uh, this is going to be quite long this week because we've got eight talking points for you and a potentially very significant one to kick off with, which will require a little bit of uh, setup here. So if you don't mind me referring you to uh, uh, just a piece that I, I read this morning um, on the Liability in Sport website, uh, this is notice that a, a very important case begins tomorrow. Uh, Talitsky versus Gibbons. On 31st of October 2016, flat jockey Freddie Talitsky's life changed forever. Uh, rounding the final bend in the 320 at Kempton, Talitsky's mount clipped heels with the mount of rider Graham Gibbons, fell and catapulted Talitsky into the surface. He was paralyzed from the waist down. In a four day trial commencing tomorrow, 29th of November 2021, the High Court in England will determine whether Gibbons' riding was negligent and he is liable to Talitsky in damages, which are quantified at in excess of £6 million. It then goes on to detail the claim that rounding the final bend, Gibbons' mount was approximately one to two widths away from the inner rail, that Gibbons knew or ought to have known that Talitsky's mount was proximate to his inside. It's alleged that Gibbons caused his mount to move across to her right, across the path of Talitsky's. Talitsky shouted a warning to Gibbons to alert him. It is disputed as to whether Gibbons' mount moved across that of Talitsky's or whether Talitsky rode his mount forward into an insufficient gap. So, Talitsky and Gibbons will rely on expert evidence in supporting their respective positions, all prominent individuals in the equestrian world. Talitsky on the evidence of fellow jockey Ryan Moore, who will return from Japan to give evidence, and Jim McGrath on the rules of racing. Gibbons on the evidence of Charles Lane, who is a steward and has experience in the equestrian world on both issues. The evidence of the respective experts is likely to be highly determinative on the issue of liability. Remember Ryan Moore and Jim McGrath. For Talitsky. He seeks general damages in excess of 200,000 for pain, suffering, and loss of amenity. He seeks special damages in excess of £6 million for past and future lifetime care. Cornelius Lysett. Um, there is one hearing this week that is going to grab an awful lot of headlines, and we'll talk about that in a minute the, the Robbie well, Dunn hearing. But they're going to be two. This, is, this is a this is a, a potentially pretty seismic moment. Yeah, and it's important for, for clearly the individuals involved, first of all. But it's important for, for racing as a whole, not just in Britain, but uh, around the world. So they are going to be debating whether there was enough room for Freddie Talitsky to, to go in there, whether the, the, the door, uh, to use a uh, phrase that is often used in races, whether the door was deliberately shut. And that is going to be the big uh, area that's, that's going to be debated. This is important for racing, but important for sport as a whole, because because clearly, uh, if you're regulating any sport where participants come very close together and there is the chance of very serious injury, then you're going to be monitoring what is decided in the High Court. These are eye-watering sums of money, aren't they? Uh, and one wonders uh, what the ramifications will be. I don't want to prejudge the case, but in the event of success for Freddie Talitsky, what does this mean for race riding in the future? Um, and I, I don't really know the answer to that, but I know that, uh, that the Professional Jockeys Association uh, and the, the participants, the actual riders themselves, are going to have to be thinking very clearly about that. So, so this is, you know, we did come into this week thinking that the, the case revolving around Robbie Dunn, which we'll talk about in a moment, was the big thing of the week. But this is the High Court, uh, presumably in London. It's four days uh, set aside for this case. Uh, and, um, you know, on the one side will be Freddie Talitsky. That was the, the incident was at Kempton in October 2016. So just over five years ago. Since then, he's been paralyzed from the waist down. He's been operating from a wheelchair. He's become a very distinguished pundit on racing, very distinguished bloodstock agent and uh, racehorse owner, I think, as well. Uh, but clearly his life changed dramatically that day. But the ramifications are vast. Uh, for this, uh, 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 as a result of these the, these four days. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder: Ryan Moore will be returning from Japan to uh, to attend that hearing and will be giving evidence in it. Uh, the Robbie Dunn case, you have heard an awful lot about on this program and elsewhere, but this is now going to be heard. Six days have been set aside for the Robbie Dunn hearing. This is into allegations of bullying and harassment uh, toward um, a jockey that we now know because of the um, case being published in the Sunday Times uh, as Brownie Frost. Yeah, 
uh, so verbally abusing and threatening a fellow rider uh, and uh, acting in a violent in a violent or improper manner and uh, three particular race days are uh, being spoken about at Stratford Utoxeter and at Southall between July and September of uh, 2020 um, well the, 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 oh, six days that's the first thing to, to mention to my initial uh, response uh, to hearing it was going to be six days was wow that's a six, long time, six, yeah. that's a long time six days I suspect it won't actually get going it's due to start on Tuesday, Tuesday. isn't it I, I suspect it won't get going as such on Tuesday in terms of, uh, of people talking about the case and witnesses and all, all that type of evidence being taken because there'll be a lot of legal wrangling here uh, and uh, the, the legal wrangling from the lawyers uh, representing Presenting Robbie Dunn, I imagine they will be attempting uh, to get the uh, to get the case thrown out because they, they believe there have been there, there have been various twists and turns during this investigation, which uh, the lawyers will claim doesn't uh, present the British Horse Racing Authority in a good light, and they will probably claim that Robbie Dunn uh, cannot get a, fair, a, a completely fair hearing in in all this. So uh, I, I suspect the wrangling will start before if the evidence is heard, etc., before we really get in uh, to that side of things. Things. But this is big, clearly, for the participants, because clearly Robbie Dunn has been accused of some serious offences in terms of racing, which could result in a considerable ban or a considerable fine. So, and he has uh, he has denied the uh, the charges. Uh, it's important, clearly, for Brownie Frost, who's uh, who's made the allegations. It's important for racing in terms of the culture within the uh, the weighing room area and amongst the uh, the riding participants. And it's important for the British Horse Racing Authority. Uh, which which may have its authority questioned as well. So this is big. So it's big in the High Court this week, and it's big in uh, the High Hoban uh, case, which uh, which starts on Tuesday. And this was the week where it was announced, on a on a positive note, that the weighing room environment, physically and literally, was going to change. There was a commitment on on the part of all racecourses and the British Horse Racing Authority to make sure not only that facilities for all were significantly upgraded, particularly in terms of the ability to, to keep fit during a race day, but also that female jockeys' facilities would quite rightly be on a par with those of their male counterparts and not before time, Cornelius. And, and not before time and no saunas uh, in future either. I was at, a, I was at a, 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 a social gathering the other day with people who aren't... Um, they have a peripheral interest in racing. And this came up because the Robbie Dunn, Brownie Frost thing has been so well publicised. And people were incredulous that in 2021, sports people taking part in an elite sport which is beamed around the world, whether it be from, from uh, Newton Abbott or from Newbury uh, or Newmarket, uh, which is beamed around the world, that participants, uh, male and female, are expected to change in roughly or to prepare in roughly the same way. And people were incredulous about this. So uh, that is, uh, it's not going to happen straight away. It's going to happen gradually, inevitably, because these things can't just, uh, just happen over Overnight. Uh, if they can happen overnight, they will happen uh, very quickly. But basically, there are going to be some considerable changes that are going to cost uh, a great deal of money. And I, I heard Dale Gibson from the Professional yeah. Jockeys Association talking to you. There are actually some fundamental issues like getting building materials uh, to actually do which the sort getting, of things. Which is quite hard at the yeah, moment. Yeah, which is, you know, is, is a, a practical point. But put that all to one side. Of course, uh, this, this uh, had to happen. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a shared valet space in future so that, uh, that there is is no need for naked men uh, and naked women to be preparing next well it probably it'd be naked men and and dressed women having to uh, prepare next to each other private changing and showering areas for under 18s that's an important safeguarding issue uh, and um, also uh, there, there is going to be sort of extra help with um, uh, 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 with managing diets etc because there won't be any saunas so so people have sort of worked out their their dietary um, regimes better now uh, since the pandemic and they couldn't have Saunas. It is a. It, it had to happen. I, I think the one that, that, that it's been talked about all year. Has it taken the publicity around Robbie Dunn and Brownie Frost to really concentrate minds on this particular area? Obviously, this isn't cult the culture, but it's connected to all that. I think the whole thing has been has made people focus minds over the last year or so. But perhaps people, when everybody started saying, "Wasn't it great? Mm. More female participants in racing." Nobody actually thought about 
uh, or as hard as perhaps they should have done about you know we are going to build up our female participants in terms of riders we're going to make big heroes of Bryony Frost and Holly Doyle and Rachel Blackmore and everybody else that I, I've missed out as well but we've got to that comes yeah. hand in hand with making certain that they've got suitable arrangements and they haven't had those and sometimes racing's not very good at thinking beyond the end of its nose. Right, let's move on to the next one, Shishkin. I'm sure I, Nicky Anderson can turn off for a couple of minutes because I know he doesn't want anyone to talk about Shishkin anymore, mm. and I can understand that. He's probably had a uh, he probably had a belly full of it. But but this is the, the, the one of the most exciting horses in training. He sat yeah. in that seat last week. We talked about the horse for for ages, and everybody wants to see him, and they're not going to see him in the Tingle Creek. And, no, um, people have got a little bit edgy about it, and Nicky's got even more edgy about the edginess that people have felt about it. <laughs> I think it. they've they've got edgy about it probably mainly, haven't they? Because he's got he they. they they perceive him to have form on this particular matter. So, there yeah, so were, if there hadn't been, if there hadn't been issues, if Altior or, and Champ, um, uh, you know, a, a little no bit of no one would nobody have would be either. going. You know, the fact is, the horse isn't ready to run in the Tingle Creek, so he's not running in the Tingle Creek now. Uh, in, in, in normally. You just say, well, that's very unfortunate. They've tried their hardest to get him ready. They're, they're a brilliant team at Seven Barrows. They've been aiming at that first Saturday in uh, in December. But he had a breathing operation. Uh, that possibly just held him back a tiny bit. And on this occasion, uncharacteristically, they've got it wrong. Uh, and he's not going to be quite ready. So he's going to go to the, uh, we expect, to the Desert Orchid chase uh, at Kempton on the 27th of December. If he doesn't turn up there, there might be a, a, a little bit of uh, hullabaloo about everything. But I uh, I'm sure that's uh, where his next race would be. So normally that would be, you know, big horse, big name, big following, doesn't turn up in big race, bad luck. But because of the uh, a glance at the form book uh, and lots of people on social media in particular, people making jokes about, you know, oh, Hendo's at it again. I, I, th I think it's a little, it's, it's, I feel, you know, he was, the initial interview, he got, he got quite irritated at Newbury on Friday. The initial interview, he was perfectly good natured. Uh, it was described on ITV as Shishkin Gate, which is an expression which, you know, ever since Watergate, people have used uh, with varying degrees of irony for this type of thing. Um, it's it's not an ideal situation. The Henderson team are uh, is obviously upset that the horse won't be there, but the horse isn't going to be there. I'm slightly inclined to feel, you know, things don't always go right in sport, uh, but the social the uh, the social media brigade in particular have got quite irritated about it and quite aerated about it. I'm I'm moderately well, I'm sympathetic towards the Henderson team personally. OK, let's talk about the restructure of the BHA. Again, probably something that you don't want to hear any more of because you've been hearing about it all week. But it is pretty fundamental. It is pretty fundamental. And if we can nutshell it in two minutes, we've done, we've done quite well. This is a, essentially, Cornelius, yeah. the stakeholders in the sport, the Horsemen's Group and the Racecourse Association, wanting to make sure that the sort of commercial base of power is in their control and the existing BHA, as it is at the moment, is, is, is not restricted to, but is primarily... Uh, in a regulatory role? Well, um, uh, practically every... I've raced at Newbury, paced, raced a couple of other places this week, uh, and pr I, I didn't find that many people that were in favour of this particular thing. And almost everybody pointed out, uh, A, that they thought there was an attempt at a palace coup here. Uh, so this emerged early in the week ahead of a meeting that took place at the British Horse, Horse Racing Authority on Tuesday, I think, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, so there, there seemed to be an element of palace coup uh, that I think people just didn't like the way that that was possibly happening. The next thing people have said is you've got the, uh, the race courses, which are very powerful, uh, and you've got the group of organisations which have that umbrella name, the Horseman's Group. No, what prospect that the participants within that umbrella of the horsemen's group would get on with each other, let alone get on with the race courses. You know, again, we've talked about form, looking at the form book. The form book would indicate that that is nowhere near certain. Just the other day, when it came to a, 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 a thing about prize money from uh, the arena racing company ARC. Uh, now, not well, that's uh, what sparked. That's what sparked. This has been the straw the camel's back. The fact is, but these two sides that say that they would, uh, the, these two parts of racing which would like to have uh, a, a real the control of the commercial side of things you know are they actually going to be able to get on well enough between themselves in order to be able to move this forward correctly there was an MP who came up with a quote that racing is successful with a strong and united voice now clearly he's correct about that but there's quite a lot of skepticism whether that strong and united voice could come from uh, the, the the control of such an important area of uh, the commercial side of things 
from the so-called horsemen's group and from the race courses. And there are plenty of other people who would actually like more power for the British Horse Racing Authority to actually be uh, to, 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 to be in control of that side of things with a couple of sports administrators towards the very top of the organisation, which probably haven't really got the confidence or the support at the moment uh, to, to show the leadership which the sport probably requires. OK, let's move on to the uh, samples from the raid in Ireland at Monastrevin. The samples of the horses that were stabled there at the time that were taken by the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board have returned negative for what they describe as prohibited at all times substances. So what that means is in those horses that they've tested that were on the premises at the time, the samples don't contain uh, the likes of anabolic steroids. Mm. Or, you know, substances don't that, actually know what the horses or, were, so uh, we don't really know whether don't they, know they're all half they in training, training, half out, out, out training, training, or whatever. We don't know who, who trained most of them either. So yeah, so we, we know that we know. blood and hair samples were taken. I suppose uh, as if the story was to really notch up a bit, mm. then there would have been some positives from all that, but but that hasn't happened. This story, though, is is not going anywhere, is it? And no. Although the, the, um, the talking points uh, headline there is Irish samples. The Irish samples were negative. This whole story is is running and going back to my social gathering the other day to, to friends who are only peripherally involved in racing you know it, it's what people are talking about outside the sport who show a bit of an interest and certainly inside the sport uh, as as well this happened on November the 9th uh, we don't know what the substances that were seized on November the 9th by the uh, officials from the Ministry of Agriculture food and marine uh, accompanied by the Gardaí uh, we don't know what those samples were so we await that with uh, bated breath uh, the Irish horse racing uh, regulatory board um, is uh, you know was it right there at the start did it know about all of this so that's yeah. another strand of the story what 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 about the intelligence that was used by those officials to actually mount the raid uh, Jessica Harrington has admitted that uh, her horses have been tested since and all of this in the context of those words from uh, Jim Bulger which have uh, have uh, which continue to resonate and uh, to echo around uh, the sport so this is a this is a, a big story that isn't going Going anywhere but what is important is that the people directly affected uh, are, are, as was demonstrated by Liam Burke in an interview in the the trade newspaper this week uh, he is one of those people he was he was present on the day of the raid uh, he has talked about you know sleepless nights and mental health yeah. and all this kind of thing so we we do have to remember while we um, glibly talk about the Irish drugs raid and the officials yeah. and intelligence and all this stuff it's directing it's affecting individuals as well uh, that comment could apply to just about any of those uh, talking points as well and it's something we always do try and take stock of uh, Gary Moore thousand winners over jumps that's oh. no mean achievement for a, a guy who's trained plenty of winners yeah. under the other code as well and he's a he's just a he's just a fabulous horse racing figure isn't he a hugely successful one but a, a a really good trainer of some some wonderful horses and uh, year in year out uh, he seems to have a horse that, even if it doesn't necessarily win everything, whether it's Goshen or whether it's uh, one of the other headline makers that he's had over the years, he has a really nice horse. Mm. That, and people seem to attach, uh, attach. Uh, they, they seem to grab hold of his horses. And I think part of the reason is because the Moore family, uh, whether it's Gary, whether it's Jane, whether it's, uh, and the children are obviously well known as well as being uh, jockeys and uh, and pundits too. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a just a, a, a really nice family story. I think the, I think the key for me in the last yeah. couple of seasons, Cornelius, is that horses of high caliber are no longer exceptions. They are almost the rule. He is now represented in in most of the you, most. You of go the to Sandown. You go to Ascot. You go to especially Cheltenham. Sandown. And yeah, Ascot, especially which he loves. Ab absolutely. Uh, and but but those of us with uh, longer memories remember him um, charging around. Plumpton and Fontwell. Mm. His, his father, Charlie Moore, who trained within within a, a furlong, a furlong and a half of the the stands at, or very close anyway, to the stands at Brighton. Uh, he was a, a tremendous character as well, and he's passed on uh, all his ingenuity. He was an ingenious uh, character, Charlie Moore, and that ingenuity has certainly passed on to Gary, and has passed on to the the next generation. So here's what G Gary and his uh, wife have produced: Ryan Moore. They've produced Josh Moore. They produced. Uh, um, Jamie Moore and they produce Haley Moore as well. Uh, what, what an extraordinary family that, that they all are. And I, I was made to feel significantly better yesterday at, uh, at Newbury because I, I was 
thinking I was being a bit of a wimp complaining about the cold until I saw Gary Moore and he said, God, it's cold, isn't it? So I was, if, he, if he felt the cold, then that was fine. That was, that was and fine in his riding me. days at Plumpton, it was really cold. Right, the... Um, What's the masks? Right, well, here's the thing. The, uh, a micron variant has now been located in the UK, um, two places last night in, in Essex and in, in Nottinghamshire, and it is now mandatory to wear a mask again in shops and on public transport, according to Sajid Javid, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care last night, um, should racecourses get ahead of the game and insist on mandatory mask wearing, given this news? Well, the, the fact is, should it get ahead of the game, the, the initial response to that is it certainly should uh, get ahead of the game. It should actually How? always... Well, so, the, so the, I, I actually, when I go racing, I have a mask in, in my pocket. I haven't used it uh, on a race course as much as I, oh, clearly I had uh, done before uh, the midsummer. But uh, the fact is, when you're indoors at the uh, races, you know, the bars at Newbury yesterday, the bars, even despite the weather at Newcastle yesterday, I dare say at Doncaster and, and elsewhere too, were, were pretty busy. So the fact is that... Uh, you know, we, we do know what the wider view of horse racing can be, and especially as Cheltenham was very much in the eye of the storm when this all uh, got underway in the spring of last year. So I would have thought it was a little bit of a no-brainer to certainly encourage people to wear masks indoors at the races uh, and to actually... Uh, are you sceptical about that or are you...? Uh... Not, not particularly. I just wonder the extent to which... Uh, the BHA will not engage reverse gear, but try and revisit some of the protocols that were in place. It has got a the, long list of protocols, hasn't it? During Which, the first um, and second yeah. and third waves of this. So what sort of thing do you, uh, uh, you know? Do I mean, our, our, will, will, I mean, if the Omicron variant starts to take hold, will those weighing room protocols be put back in place, for example? Yeah. As uh, they were before. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they would be... Yeah, that, that would be an, an, an obvious route. Uh, well, they start limiting crowd numbers. Well, that, that, it's those type of things which will send shockwaves. But at the moment, as far as the British government is concerned, there's no suggestion. You know, they want masks in shops, probably in shopping malls as well, on public transport. Plenty of people have been doing that, uh, that all those sort of things anyway. It's going to be the enforcing thing that's going to be really interesting because, you know, as we well know, we just need to look across the channel to, to Holland and, uh, and other countries there. There's actually been rioting over all of this. Uh, and uh, that is a situation that clearly the British government will want to avoid. But there's no suggestion at the moment of uh, limiting uh, the, the limiting numbers and that kind of thing. However, if you're talking and about British racing getting ahead of the game, that is never a bad thing. And you're, you can't take your winter sunshine in South Africa, I'm afraid, Cornelius, uh, this year. But it's fine because uh, you'll be able to go to Linkfield. Uh, is there a big event on nearly, at Linkfield? Which is nearly as good. Just before we finish the talking points, Paul Nichols has been on. He says Nick Monmiral is absolutely fine this morning. Good. Thank you for letting us know, Paul. He sustained a very nice he cut when one of the other runners jumped into him but will be okay as you say back to the drawing board i am okay by the way i'm just halfway through self-isolating hence being grounded we'll be at sandown at the end of the week can't wait can't wait we won't see shishkin but we will see pf nichols oh you can bet your bottom dollar yeah. that we'll see pf nichols uh, and probably two or three runners from his yard as well in the tingle creek cornelius thank you very much that's me done, is it? That's you done. I'm off to Lingfield. No, I'm not. I'm going home. <laughs> those Can't were, wait for the Hatton's Grace. Those were this week's uh, talking points. Mick Appleby coming up.